Welcome to Spotlight ETSU. I'm your host, Carrie Oliveira. Today I'll be speaking with Dr. Hadi Mamudu about his research on tobacco control and health policy. Dr. Mamudu recently co-authored a book entitled Global Tobacco Control, Power, Governance, and Transfer. He's also written for a number of publications about health policy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Mamudu. Thank you, Carol, for the invitation. You're very welcome. We're excited to talk to you because it sounds to me like your research is doing really important work, both like in terms of health management as well as like the global impact of tobacco control. But before we get to talking about that, I want to talk about you a little bit. So why okay. don't you tell me how, where you're from and how it is that you ended up at ETSU. Okay, my name is uh, Hadi Mahmoud and uh, I'm originally from Ghana. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did my uh, undergraduate at the uh, University of Ghana, Legon. And in two, 2000, I came over to uh, the United States to do my master's. So where? I, that's uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where I had my MPA degree. So afterwards, I moved to uh, West Virginia University, where I did a master's in uh, arts and my PhD. So from there, I moved on to uh, University of California, San Francisco, to do my postdoctoral degree mm -hmm. program. Then I came over to uh, ETSU in 2009 as a faculty. You've been all over the country. Yes. What's your from favorite part? <laughs> from the, I know, really, from the West Coast to all the way to West Virginia. What's your favorite part of the country? Yeah, I enjoy living in the... Uh, eastern uh, side of the U.S. and especially this uh, Appalachian region. So that's the reason why I came back to uh, this way. Yeah, <laughs> ETSU. Oh, I like that very much. That's cool. And so you work in the department of? Currently, I work in the Department of uh, Health, Services, Health Services, Management and Policy in the College of Public Health. College of Public Health. And so how is it that you came to be interested in studying tobacco control specifically? Or is this a, a recent? sort of interest of yours? Okay, this, uh, the whole interest in uh, tobacco control began in uh, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm very much interested in issues of uh, international relations. Mm -hmm. So in 2003, when I was doing my uh, PhD and I was about to write my dissertation, there was this uh, negotiation of an international global treaty going on in Geneva. And I said, oh, geez, uh, interested in our international relations. I'm interested in health policy. How do it's we combine the how two? How do you combine <laughs> the two? And right. this is an opportunity for me. And uh, I began doing tobacco control research since then. So your, your interest wasn't originally necessarily in tobacco control. You just wanted to have some convergence of health and international policy. Exactly. So tobacco control became an interest of yours. In, how, how is it that you ended up then being able to study tobacco? I mean, I imagine you could study any number of health things, right? Well, I was looking at your, your resume and your vita. There's, a, I mean, any number of health issues that go on internationally. So how is it that you ended up doing tobacco control research? Yeah, tobacco is interesting in this way. And uh, my main reason why it caught my interest is that you look at so many health issues, you see that tobacco is one of the leading preventable cause of illnesses and uh, mortality worldwide. Yes. And as we're talking today, it kills about 6 million people worldwide. And in the U.S. alone, it kills about 443,000 people a year. Oh my goodness. So it's just like, it's nothing compared to the rest of other right. uh, health issues. And if that converges with uh, international relations mm -hmm. issues, that was a great opportunity for me to run with it. So when you are interested in international issues from a, like a public health standpoint, are you interested in building policy internationally or specifically what, when, when you tell me you're concerned with international issues, what exactly did you see yourself doing in your career where that was concerned? Yeah, my concern was more or less about uh, building some form of uh, international collective actions. Mm. Some of these issues, uh, health-related issues, cut across national bodies. Mm -hmm. in, in essence, they are more transnational issues. So if they are transnational issues, how are we going to deal with it among states? Right. For example, we have uh, the largest tobacco co company in the world located in the US, which is Philip Morris. Right. And Philip Morris sells eight products worldwide. Right. So. If we have a situation where six million people are dying worldwide, yes, U.S. cannot handle it alone. Right. So there have to be some form of a international collective action and collaboration to do with such a problem. What I find really interesting about that is that we need to have international collaboration to solve a problem. But what's at the essence of the existence of this problem is that we have an American company exporting its product to the rest of the world. So it would be really easy to just sort of, you know, 
tell Philip Morris to stop sh sh shipping cigarettes across the, across the globe, that's not going to happen, it's, of course. It's not easy that way. It's not this is, a, in, in looking at the, the bio information that they gave me before uh, to pre prepare for your interview, one of the things that I noticed is that the, the business of exporting tobacco products is a fairly recent thing for American tobacco companies, at least on the scale that it is right now, because Americans have figured out that it's bad for them to smoke, and so in order to build a profit, tobacco companies have to export and find market elsewhere. Okay, I think uh, you have, it's just one aspect of the issue. Okay. So uh, for that, you are correct on that point. Right. In a sense that, uh, think, think in terms of this way. In the 1950s, 1960s, the smoking rate in the U.S. was in the 50s and in the, in the 60s. Today, the smoking rate in the U.S. is about 20%. Oh. So that has dropped dramatically. Right. And tobacco companies must make their profit. Right. So where do they go? They have to elsewhere. Elsewhere <laughs> and uh, market their product. So that's one of the key aspects of it. But also in other terms, you look at it, we have this globalization phenomenon going on around the world, yes. where there's this international trade right. that's bringing countries around the world closer and closer together. Yes. So whilst the U.S. Uh, companies have just uh, the uh, downturn in smoking rate in the U.S. has contributed to this phenomenon, mm -hmm. don't forget that the globalization of the world has also played a part in this uh, phenomenon. So if the United States has seen a sh rather sharp decrease in the number of people who smoke cigarettes, be what, in the last four decades. Mm -hmm. What has caused that, and how, to what extent can we implement whatever solved that problem or shrank that problem in an in international context? Okay, so the main uh, reason why there's this dramatic decrease in smoking rate is, I call it controls. Okay. The U.S. used the approach of controlling the use of tobacco. Previously, um, I think in the history of this country, you remember the question of uh, prohibition of alcohol, which failed. Yes. I guess it was horribly. <laughs> it failed horribly. And even in states like Tennessee, they even also tried to uh, prohibit uh, tobacco use in the 1910s and uh, 1920s. That also failed. Right. So that approach is somehow a failure. Right. So what do we have to do with uh, this problem that we, we know. Tax. Tax. Create smoke-free environment. Yes. Advertising ban. Remember, the tobacco companies were using uh, advertising to females just to recruit females to smoke. Right. Okay, so all these were just the approach of controlling the use of tobacco with so many uh, policies and programs, including taxation that you have already mentioned, mm -hmm. smoke-free environments, mm -hmm advertising ban, educational campaigns, right. and of course, uh, helping people uh, for, to engage in a cessation programs right. has helped the U.S. to have that downturn. And to what extent are those same kind of control policies uh, implementable worldwide? Is, what's the challenge in making that happen elsewhere? Okay, the U.S. has a strong regulatory mechanism, right. and it's a powerful state, mm -hmm. just to put it. So it is able to what? go about all this, implement this, even against what? The resistance of tobacco companies. Yes. So compare it to a small country like uh, Malawi or even Ghana, where I am from, mm -hmm. where they compare, comparing the profit of Philip Morris to even the GDP mm -hmm. of Ghana, you cannot, there is no any comparison. Right. Because uh, GDP of uh, the income of uh, the profit of Philip Morris is way bigger than the GDP of Ghana. Right. So in this case, Ghana cannot deal with this problem. So what came out of this uh, realization was what we call it the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Okay. And the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is a kind of uh, international treaty on uh, tobacco control, which uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, spearheaded mm -hmm. in the development of that treaty. And within this framework of uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Mm -hmm. We have all these regulatory mechanisms that we've already talked about. Right. Tax increases, advertisement ban, and everything. So as at this point in time, we have, I think, uh, 174 countries have already signed onto that treaty. Okay. But ironically, 
US, which has most of the uh, programs, policies, in this treaty, the US has not signed onto this uh, treaty. And why is that? Uh, of course, this, the political system is very tough yes. to uh, ratify any kind of international treaty. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. So with that global uh, treaty, now uh, countries around the world has a toolbox of policies and programs right. to draw on. Yes. So now. You, go, you look around the world, every country is now trying to implement issues of uh, taxation, issues of advertising ban, creating more small free policies, all because of this coll uh, collective action at the global level, mm -hmm. having impact at the domestic level. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. But uh, just to quickly add to it, do you know what the tobacco companies are fighting it all around the world? Of course they are, because <laughs> otherwise that eats into their profit <laughs> margin. And so yeah. we don't want, I mean, certainly, especially if like, yes, we can grow our own profit if we just take advantage of globalization and we have to find market elsewhere when the market in the United States is decreased. We're going to go everywhere. And so if the, United, if the entire globe starts controlling tobacco too much, then I, well, Philip Morris is going to have to go into something else. <laughs> and when that's their primary industry, I imagine they don't want to reconfigure their entire business model. Yeah. And... Uh, they are very smart at undermining policies and programs to keep that one in mind. Very smart lawyers. Very smart lawyers. <laughs> Let me, on this even lawyer issue, uh, in recently uh, in 2009, the U.S. gave uh, the Congress gave the FDA the power to regulate tobacco. Okay. And uh, one of the programs that uh, the FDA came up with was a graphic warning on tobacco products. Yes. And do you know what the case is now in the court? the tobacco companies are not fighting it. Because it's because untrue? Because it's not untrue, right? <laughs> I, I believe because basically they know that it is uh, effective pro uh, right. policies and it, it may just shrink their market. And so the case they're making ultimately is that the, the, the United States government is trying to prevent them from making money. It's, uh, of course, you know they are right. They have the trademark and they have the right they yes. are companies, so they have the right to have their uh, make any kind of uh, packages that they want. Right. And it's uh, the FDA has no business to tell them what to do. Yeah. Hmm. So the case is currently pending in the U.S. courts. That is, and as, as in your professional opinion, what do you think the outcome of that case is likely to be? <laughs> it's uh, I cannot, frankly, I've well, been following the case, but I cannot predict uh, the outcome. It's, well, it's that's tough. not very adventurous of you, yeah. <laughs> but I can understand that. I mean, I, I imagine both both sides of the debate have a reasonable case, and so I guess it just matter, comes down to what law is most applicable, which I'm sad to say I don't know anything about. You were talking about one of the ways that um, the United States population has decreased its tobacco use is by way of creating smoke-free environments. So on ETSU's campus, back in, what was it, 2007 or 2008, we went to a tobacco-free campus only, I'm not sure whether you've noticed this or not, but it's not a particularly tobacco-free campus at all. Why is that? Okay, uh, I think uh, I, I did a study on the uh, ETSC tobacco-free campus in uh, 2010, and uh, I think one of the study that I did was uh, a, su a survey of uh, uh, the employee population as well as a survey of uh, the student population. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can, I just want to draw attention to the fact that the survey on the student population, uh, sorry, the employee population was published in the Journal of uh, Community Health. So it's now in already in, in print. Right. Yeah. But what happens was, regardless of uh, what we've been seeing on campus, ETSU has one of the best smoke-free, or I would say tobacco-free policies in the state. It's simple. You cannot smoke anywhere, but except your in car, your car. Except in your car. Right. Except that people smoke yeah. in places other than their cars. <laughs> so my uh, our study that we did in 2010, we found that uh, about 80 percent of the employees that we uh, participated in our survey, they've observed people not complying with the law. Yes. Which is a big issue on ETSU campus. Yes. But at the same time. Over eighty percent of the population support the policy. Okay. So that's the good news. That is good news. Yeah. If you have a 
a policy that people are not complying with, but we have a huge support, support for it. That, that was a good news among the employee population. But it doesn't promote enforcement of the policy necessarily. That's, that's the big issue. Right. So the big, the big gap here is not the policy. The big gap here is the issue of enforcement and compliance. Yes. And my understanding of the policy is that there's no, there's really no way ultimately to enforce the policy because there's no fine or specific like actual penalty for being caught smoking on campus. And so public safety can't have anything to do with it. And so really it's just a matter of like citizens policing one another. And I have, I will say, walked out of this building on the first floor and seen people smoking outside the back of this building. And I'll say, dude, Go sit in your car, or at least, very least, you know what? Don't do it right by the door, and they like shoot me a dirty look, and that's the end of it. And so, if if we have a bunch of smokers who are not complying with the policy, and there's no way for us to actually enforce the policy, what are we to do to improve the situation? Because I've heard lots of complaints about students walking by certain buildings on campus and being bombarded in a cloud of smoke. Okay, I think uh, what you said, I had similar experience. Okay, and I think I uh, I was able to publish my experience in the East Tennessee, and that is the campus uh, news newspaper. Paper. I also, I just went and I saw these two uh, students smoking mm -hmm. just behind the cop center. Yes. And I said, guys, do you know that on this campus, this campus is smoke-free uh, policy? They just went off on me. Right? <laughs> but the interesting aspect of it was that I went to the student affairs to at least inquire whether there's somebody in charge of even just reporting. Yeah. None. None. Nothing. Nothing was there. But at the same time, uh, think in terms of this way. We have this problem, but uh, when we did our survey, we realized that the policy has helped about 20% 20 20 of uh, the employee population either cut down the volume of cigarettes that is smoke or quit. Oh. So that's, with all this, uh, compliance and enforcement issue. Right. That's a good uh, take home message. That, that's a really like, was that, I, I can't imagine that that was one of the anticipated outcomes of the policy. I think they just wanted to create a, a more healthy campus. Yes, but, uh, but in, create, in trying to create that healthy campus, some of the uh, faculty and uh, employees or in the general employee population, they are either reducing the volume that they smoke have or quit free. altogether, which of course is the whole point of creating smoke-free environments, right? Mm -hmm. If it's too much of a hassle for me to go have a cigarette, I'm not going to go do it. It's just yes. easier for me to quit altogether. That's, uh, that's true. Then I, uh, I also want to uh, share with you what we found in our student survey. Please do. And uh, in the student survey, the uh, response were just biased towards uh, smokers. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because because of the problem. So smokers self-selected into the self study? Self-selection, yeah. But the good news of uh, this uh, survey was that even among, in a survey where the uh, smokers are just overwhelmingly overrepresented, yes. about 64 to 70% of them still support the policy. So more smokers than non-smokers in the study, and still we're so seeing up to 70% support of the policy. Up to 70%. By smokers. Not by smokers, no. but with, by the respondent population. Altogether. Altogether. So Including it means that includes smokers, smokers yes. also supporting the policy. So what then are your thoughts about the Student Government Association's attempt to revise the smoking policy on campus to create um, smoking areas? on campus. That's the worst thing you can do. Worst thing you can do. You do, do you not suppose that if we create smoking, I'm just playing a devil's advocate mm -hmm. here, right, of course. So if we create designated smoking areas on campus, will this is gonna promote people smoking in designated areas as opposed to smoking, say, outside of entrances to buildings? Do you suppose that would work? You are arguing like a tobacco company lobbyist. <laughs> oh, <you know. laughs> it's a skill, maybe yeah. I have a second career possibly. This is, we've, uh, I've been in tobacco control for a while, and we've, I've read about uh, evidence on this issue. Yes. Rem guess what? It was the tobacco company's strategy, <laughs> just to normalize tobacco use. Yes. So if you create a designated smoking area, you are in a way normalizing tobacco You're use. You're promoting the you behavior. Are prom you are promoting the behavior. Yes. And uh, in even ETSU, I think, uh, I'm not sure about this, but... I think there was a history before they had a tobacco-free 
campuses right where they had places that people can go to smoke right and uh they weren't doing it so because basically it says you can smoke on campus it, and can. it doesn't uh, really in the end it doesn't matter where you do it yeah it's called tobacco company people they call it courtesy of choice or what they call it accommodation mm, so I see. it's just a way of trying to normalize tobacco so that's the worst thing that they can do etsu uh, policy is good as it is one remember as i told you it has helped about 20 uh, percent of employees to either reduce the volume of uh, tobacco that they use or even cut down tobacco right there's about uh, up to about 80 uh, percent of support for uh, the policy among the employee population right up to about 70 percent support of the policy among uh, student population yes so the issue here is the problem is not with the policy yes the problem is how to find a way of enforcing and ensuring compliance. And so what would your suggestion be to help us in better enforce the policy so that we have higher degrees of compliance on campus? Yeah, uh, usually I don't believe in just strict, uh, strict approach of penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, my approach will be trying to find a way to educate the student population because there has been very, very, uh, I would say, uninformed people about the policy on this campus, yeah. Unlike, I uh, feel like the policy is pretty well advertised. Yeah, it, but unlike you, unlike uh, alcohol, where there's a group or a group of, uh, I would say, an advocacy group that's strongly what promoting alcohol uh, or maybe educating people against alcohol use. Right. There's, I've never I've been here for three years. I've not seen any kind of uh, tobacco or smoking education program on campus. That is very interesting. And part of what, I mean, I think part of the challenge too in getting people to stop, it's not just smoking, but it's tobacco use in general. And you've lived all over the country and I've lived in a couple of different places in the country. And I will say that the smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco, is the number of people in East Tennessee or the South in general who use smokeless tobacco products is extremely high as compared to the other places I've lived in the country. So I think part of the problem too is not just the smoking, but it's about tobacco education. Yeah, it's, it's not just about the smoking. Altogether. Be, yeah, it's about tobacco. And that's what is uh, good with the ETS use policy. Right. It's not about smoking, it's right. about tobacco, tobacco use. use. Yeah. So the question is, the question now, I, I will just maybe take this opportunity to ask of uh, the SGA is, the question is not the revision of the policy. Right. The question is trying to find a way to enhance compliance and or find a way to enforce the policy. And so your suggestion ultimately is there should be some organization that is designed specifically to provide education, education about, about it. About the policy or about, about how to quit smoking? Uh, all of it. All of it. All of it. Yeah, because uh, if uh, I want to, I'm a smoker, mm -hmm. and you tell me, okay, don't smoke here. You have to provide an avenue for me to quit. Yes. So it's not just an issue of uh, creating the smoke-free environment. It's also an issue of uh, creating the avenue for people to also quit. Do you know of any programs on campus that are um, smoking cessation programs for students? Uh, I've had a, a, a little interaction with, uh, I think, the, uh, what, is, what do you call it, the, the student health services. Yes. Yeah. And now they have uh, some programs that can help students to quit. But the issue is, are students aware of even these programs? Right. Well, I, I mean, I wasn't, and I'm fairly well tapped into what the students know, and so I wasn't aware that there is a, any kind of program on campus for students to avail themselves if they wish to quit smoking or using any kind of tobacco products. And so why is that information not being disseminated better across campus? Yeah, that's why I said we have to find that mechanism or any kind of instruments to just make sure that we inform the students about the policy and also maybe create a body or even a task force where there will be a form of reporting. Right. So, for example, if you go to the back of your building and the people are smoking, you tell them, guys, do you know that you can't smoke here? And they say, forget it. You can call those people and say, okay, I've seen some guys here. Can you just come over right. and tell them? And handle this. Handle this situation. So if at least there will be an outward show of like concern of enforcement, yes, it will just percolate through the student population. And, of course, there will still be some hardcore people who will be very difficult to deal with. Yes. But most invariably, most of the people will comply with the policy. 
So, so far you haven't seen any decrease in the number of students who are reporting using tobacco as a result of the policy. It's impacted employees, but not so much students. Yeah, we've not, uh, we're still analyzing the uh, student survey. Right. But the big issue with uh, the student uh, survey is that student population is a transient population. Yes. Yes. That's a big challenge. Yes. But you know, faculty especially on this campus where such a small percentage mm -hmm. of students live on the campus, mm -hmm. so we have the commuter problem on top of the, the transiency the in a transient. university policy yeah. anyway. So somebody who was here in, a, for example, in 2008 when the policy was imp implemented is no longer here. Right. So it's very difficult to assess the, uh, the impact right. of the policy on uh, the student behavior. But for uh, faculty, it's easy very, because yeah. they have the longitudinal data. Yes. And uh, they are even stable. Yes. The people, the, we just, I was here in 2008. Yeah. Were you smoking? Yes. yes. Are you smoking now? Are you smoking now? Less of that. Less of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So we, this beautiful book, I love, it's, you know, it's pretty with the smoke billowing on the cover. I don't know if it's supposed <laughs> to be pretty. So you are uh, one of three authors on this one. So can you tell me really quickly about what the content of this book specifically focuses on? Okay. The book is basically, we are, uh, I have the political science background as right. well. Yeah. So we are three political scientists. Uh, the first uh, author, which is uh, Professor. Wait, three political scientists wrote a book on global tobacco policy yes. that I find very interesting. OK. OK. So three political scientists. The first author is in the University of Aberdeen, UK, right. where he does research right. on uh, tobacco use and tobacco control in UK and within the Euro European Union. Mm -hmm. Then the second one, uh, which is uh, Donnelly Stulo, who happens to be my uh, advisor when I was a graduate student. And in, in a way, he contributed to the reason why I became involved in tobacco control. Right. Yeah. He's one of the pioneer guys, uh, political scientists in tobacco control. Yes. So he does a lot of uh, domestic tobacco control. And in most cases, his research is on comparative uh, policy. So he compares policies of US vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Canada and other developed countries. OK. OK. Then I do uh, research in global tobacco control. So okay. the three of us came together and said, OK, let's try to provide at least an intellectual basis for tobacco control worldwide. Yes. So uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Kenny just wrote, uh, policies about UK, uh -huh. and uh, Studlow wrote policies about US, Yes, and I looked at the issue at the global level, okay. that's the collective action level. So that's how the book is, uh, uh, put, was put together. But we use this uh, frame, in, of course, in political scientists, we believe in theories, models, and so forth. And oh, so very forth. social science, yes, yeah, I, social science. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we decided to use a, a social science frame. And our frame, we call it the multiple theories frame. Okay. Yeah. And what we looked at it is how there's a change going on if you look at uh, the policy. If you look at the uh, US, there has been a very dramatic change in policies in the US. Right. The policies that we see in the US here today, for example, even in Tennessee, we now have what? The Non-Smokers Protection Act. Oh, okay which never existed 50 years ago. Right. But 50 years ago, we knew the problem. Yes. So we try to answer why there's always lag in evidence. Uh, yes. Lag of policy, even though we have- uh, Even though we recognize the problem, the problem, why are we taking so long to attempt to solve it? Right. That makes a lot of sense. And so the book then primarily deals with this, uh, partly the policy, issue. Yeah, well, the issue of policy change in tobacco control. And one of the things that we just identified was the issue of institutions. Right. When there's, uh, you look at uh, if the policy is controlled. I don't want to interrupt you. I'm about to run out of time, though. But what I think is really interesting about what you're working on here is that what, w there's a clear identification of a problem, and you're trying to solve it. And I think that's wonderful work. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mamudu. We were speaking with Dr. Hadi Mamudu about his research on tobacco control. Join us next time on Spotlight ETSU.